This lesson is on Moralgia Parasthetica, which is a condition involving numbness and tingling sensations on the thigh. In this lesson, we're going to talk about why this condition occurs, some of the pathophysiology behind why it happens. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So Moralgia Parasthetica is a mononeuropathy condition involving neuropathic pain and abnormal sensation of the anterior lateral thigh. So it's a mononeuropathy condition, meaning that it is involving one nerve. It involves neuropathic pain and abnormal sensation, so it's going to involve numbness and tingling sensation with pain on the anterior lateral thigh. So the anterior thigh, so you can think of the front of the thigh and along the side. So it's going to be in this general area here. Now this condition is due to injury or compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, or LFCN. So this is the reason why this condition may also be referred to as lateral femoral cutaneous nerve syndrome. Now epidemiological data indicates that this condition is not that common, but it may actually be unrecognized. So there may be more individuals who have this than is actually showing up in the data. And there is a higher prevalence of this condition in the fourth and fifth decade of life. And it's more common in obese patients and pregnant patients, and we'll see why that is when we talk about the pathophysiology and some of the causes later on in this lesson. Now let's talk about the anatomy and pathophysiology as to why this condition occurs. So again, it all has to do with the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is located here, and it actually originates from L2 and L3, or the second and third lumbar nerve of the lumbosacral plexus. So the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is a pure sensory nerve, so it is only involved in sensation, it has no motor functioning. And again, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, or the LFCN, is responsible for anterior lateral thigh sensation, so here are some diagrams showing where that sensation is located. And the LFCN actually traverses from the lumbosacral plexus, this is again the lumbosacral plexus here, and it traverses through the inguinal ligament. So here's the inguinal ligament I just added here. So the inguinal ligament is going to extend from the anterior superior iliac spine down toward the symphysis pubis. Now the anterior superior iliac spine is the bony prominence that you can feel when you feel around your belt line. So it's the tip of the hip bone. So you can feel that bony prominence. So the LFCN is going to traverse through the inguinal ligament, actually through a tunnel through that ligament, very close to the anterior superior iliac spine. It's actually around one centimeter medial to that anterior superior iliac spine or the aces. So it's right close to that bony prominence. And the reason why this condition occurs is because of some compression or impingement or some injury in and around that area. So right around the aces, that is where we're going to have issues. So it's going to be focal entrapment of the LFCN, and this is what's going to cause a lot of these neurological findings we're going to talk about in the upcoming slides. So now that we know that Moralgia Parasthetica is caused by impingement or compression of the LFCN as it traverses through the inguinal ligament, this can help us understand some of the causes behind this condition. So the causes of Moralgia Parasthetica are going to be broken down into spontaneous causes and iatrogenic. Iatrogenic simply means that they are acquired from healthcare or hospital procedures. So in the spontaneous category, some of the causes or some of the lifestyle activities that can increase the likelihood of having symptoms of Moralgia Parasthetica include tight or restrictive clothing. So one example would be tight jeans. Again, it's around the belt line. So if you have very, very tight pants on, this can cause some numbness and tingling sensation in the anterior lateral thigh. We can also see certain clothing accessories that can lead to or cause this condition as well. So it can lead to impingement of the LFCN. And some examples would be tool belts. Tight seat belts can also cause this condition as well. We can see lying in a fetal position, especially in prolonged positioning. So if you're in a fetal position, the way your body is in that position, it can actually cause compression in and around the ACEs on the LFCN. Diabetes can also cause neuralgia parasitica through diabetic neuropathy. So diabetic neuropathy can cause issues with nerve functioning or cause nerve damage to multiple nerves in the body, and the LFCN is one of them. Obesity is also another cause. If there's a large abdomen or a large panis that is hanging and compressing down in and around the aces that can cause this condition as well. 
pregnancy is also another cause. So the larger belly and abdomen can lead to a compression in and around the aces and lead to this condition as well. So this is the reason why we talked about prevalence of this condition being higher in these two groups. Hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is also another cause of this condition. Hypothyroidism can cause issues with neurological functioning in different nerves. And again, the LFCN is one of them. Alcoholism. Alcoholism can cause neuropathy as well. And then a neoplasm or pelvic mass. So if there's some mass in the pelvic area, it can lead to compression of the LFCN or the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve leading to this condition as well. And then some other spontaneous causes can include direct trauma. So if there's been direct impact or trauma to that area that can cause damage to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Ischemia. So ischemia, if there's been a loss of blood flow to that area, that can also be a cause. And then stretch injury. If there's been some issue with an accident or some type of physical activity that has led to a stretch injury to the hip in and around the aces that can cause or increase the likelihood of this condition as well. Now some iatrogenic causes can include hip replacement surgery. So if there's surgery in and around that area that can lead to damage to the LFCN and cause myralgia parasitica. And some other surgeries including laparoscopic surgeries, spine surgery, bariatric surgery, and pelvic hip related surgeries have all been implicated or associated with the onset of myralgia parasitica. Now let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms of myralgia parasitica. So again, it's going to involve the anterior lateral thigh and it's going to involve pain. So this is going to be called costalgia and it's often going to be described as a burning pain and it can be described as an aching pain as well. Paresthesias can also occur in this area. So paresthesias are going to be numbness and tingling sensations on the anterior lateral thigh. And sometimes it can be so severe that they can lead to pain themselves. And then another clinical feature of myralgia parasitica is hyperesthesia. So hyperesthesia is going to be an increased sensitivity to touch. And related to this is something called dysesthesia, which is simply an abnormal sensation. So the symptoms of this condition can occur over weeks to months. And signs and symptoms are going to generally be unilateral, meaning that they're only going to occur on one side, so on one thigh as opposed to both. But in some cases, it can be bilateral. So both thighs can be affected, and this occurs in approximately 20% of cases. And generally speaking, symptoms can be worsened with walking and standing, but improved with sitting. But it depends on how a person may sit, if they are sitting kind of scrunched in a certain way that can lead to compression on the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, that is not going to improve their symptoms. It may actually worsen their symptoms. So in general, symptoms may be worsened with walking and standing, but improve with sitting, but certain positions can make this worse. So I do want to mention that as well. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment of this condition. So the diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis. So it's going to involve a history and physical examination, looking for those causes we talked about before and looking for those signs and symptoms. And then doing a physical examination can be, can be important as well. So tapping over the inguinal ligament or posterior stretching of the leg can reproduce symptoms. So if you were to tap over the inguinal ligament, roughly one centimeter medial to the anterior superior iliac spine, that can reproduce symptoms. And there's a particular clinical test that can be performed, which is called pelvic compression testing. So this is where there's deep palpation below the aces. So deep palpation, roughly one centimeter medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. So you press really deeply into that area. And if there's reproduction of symptoms, that would be a positive test. And nerve conduction studies may be used in some cases if the diagnosis of myralgia parasitica is not entirely known. So if there's any uncertainty in the diagnosis, nerve conduction studies may be performed. EMG or electromyography is normal. So this can help rule out some other conditions. And then once the clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? So it's important to fix the underlying cause. If it's due to obesity, it'd be important to lose weight. If it's due to tight clothing, it'd be important to get better fitted clothing. Or if it's caused by hypothyroidism, treating the thyroid condition can be helpful. And in some cases, this condition can remit spontaneously. So it can go away spontaneously on its own in some cases. Some other treatments for this condition include non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs like ibuprofen. A local nerve block can be used in some cases, so a mixture of lidocaine and corticosteroids. This is often going to be for severe cases. Neuropathic pain medications can be used in severe cases, although they are generally rarely effective, so medications like gabapentin may be used. And then in some other cases, surgery can be employed. This is again going to be in rare cases, so it's going to be surgical decompression. So surgical decompression of the LFCN can be helpful in some cases as well. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.